Kitco News special coverage of the New Orleans Investment Conference is brought to you by Uranium Energy Corp, Uranium Royalty, Gold Mining and Gold Royalty Corp. You're watching Kitco News coming to you from the New Orleans Investment Conference. I'm Michelle McQuarrie and joining me now is Jim Urio. Jim is the Managing Director of TJM Institutional Services. Jim, very good to have you with us. Thank you. Jim, silver is finally starting to move a little bit this week. Silver up about 4% for the week. Is silver finally moving into the spotlight? I believe it is. I, I, I've been long silver for quite a while and it's been a painful trade. Um, I think it is. Uh, copper broke out of a pretty um, significant technical pattern last week, and I believe silver's following it today. Now, the, the way silver's traded has been interesting, and I've been trying to make this argument for a long time, but being right about an argument is different than being right about the price, obviously. Uh, silver has been uh, trading with gold. It's been kind of dead money for about the last six, seven months. Um, I believe the market was viewing it as a precious and trading it like a precious, and I believe that the, the two... $0.5 trillion cryptocurrency market was attracting some of the speculative inflation hedge, fiat currency risk hedge money, and it was leaving gold and silver for dead for the moment. I think that both of those things are going to change, but I think the silver is changing now. To what degree? To what degree? I think silver could easily trade back up to 35-ish from you know where, where, where it close at today, probably around 25. I've been buying it earlier in the week. Um, I think that 22 was the level. Once it came above 22, I think that, that there's great upside. Where do you see silver in 12 months time? 12 months times I'd say at about 35. $35. And yeah. what would you say are the fundamentals pushing silver higher? So, well, fundamentals are only go so far. It's the perception of fundamentals that I think is even more important to me. Silver could easily be grouped in some of the Green New Deal commodities, like copper, for instance. Copper, people are loving copper. We used to associate copper just with the China story and the China growth story. And I think that's changed a lot too. And I think part of that is the fact that copper is involved in the Green New Deal initiative. It's five times as much copper is used in an electric vehicle than in a combustion engine. Now, silver is used in solar panels. So silver is used in um, you know, electric con conductivity, which is very, very important in the New Green Deal. Now, I'm going to make this point. I want to make sure you understand it, is that I don't know what amounts are used in solar panel. I don't care. Here's what I care about. I care when the market changes its focus and decides that silver is going to be the flavor of the day, the month, the six-month period. And I believe that's happening right now. And that's what technical analysis tells me. So I use the fundamental story. And I think the fundamental story is real. And when I say I don't care, I'm, trying, I'm being a little bit right. overdramatic. I do care. But, but the, the, the fundamental story is not as important as the fact that the market comes to this realization at a time and you just try to be ahead of it. Why do you think that the market is now finally going to come to this realization? Because of your and my conversation. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, I, we it, do have a lot of viewers on Kiko, but sure. I don't know if we have that many no, to create no, that, I'm just that joking kind of hype, that it's just, yes. No, what you do, that's when you rely on your technical analysis to decide when that's happening. And Silver had a very interesting pattern that it broke below key support at the $22 level in the silver futures contracts. It spent about a cup of coffee there and then shot right back above it. To me, that was the first signal that that was perhaps going to respect that support level. And then it started building a base from there. So to me, that's an indication that my fundamental thesis is being, it's not my fundamental thesis, the fundamental thesis is being embraced by some and they're starting to get into silver. And that's the technical kind of, and the fundamental go together like that. All right, so silver is moving into its time to shine. That's what I believe, time to shine. Thank you for that. <laughs> can't, can't have too many precious metals. Puns. No, not at all. You mentioned the industrial use of silver um, as a fundamental that you're not that focused on because you're more focused on sentiment. But on the industrial side, do you see global supply shortages and shortages of chips impacting the demand for silver in its use in electric devices? Do you see that hampering the industrial demand? Sure, and I think that's part of the reason that silver wasn't doing very well over the last few months. I think that was part of that um, with the demand story. I think that going forward, and if we really do believe that supply chains are going to be resolved and that production in all different areas of all different things, silver being used for many of those, 
I think that that's a valid story. So your premise is that these supply chain issues will be resolved. These microchip issues will be resolved. It's a question. Of course, it's go everything is transitory, including you know, our lives. I mean, <laughs> so you say everything is transitory, and then I have to bring up inflation. Of course. Because one of the persistent themes that we're hearing in this conference is that this notion that the Fed is telling us that inflation is transitory, not so accurate. What's your read on inflation? It, it's absolute nonsense. So it, I'll break it down this way. So. The Fed continues to say that it's the supply chain disruptions that are causing uh, inflation. The, the demand story is just as compelling, and the demand is in two separate ways. There's the organic demand that happened post-pandemic from pent-up demand, and there's also the uh, inorganic demand that's been caused by the Fed keeping rates at zero, the federal government just continually injecting money into the, into the system, you know, running up a national debt that's got, gained $7 trillion over the last um, year and a half. That's mind boggling to me. Three trillion of it went direct, direct to people, direct to the retail, let's call it. 1.6 in direct payments, 1.2 in forgivable loans to small business. Um, they just keep pouring money into the system. Um, the inflation thing, there's one other component of it too that's just starting to happen now. Now I always rant about modern monetary theory, which is the, the theory that's been pushed forward by Dr. Stephanie Kelton Moser. I'm sure everyone talks about it as well too. But one of the key tenets of that too, it's in chapter six, and it's, it's just brilliant the way it's playing out too. They talk about wages and wage inflations, and they believe it's the federal government's job as we're coming out of any sort of crisis to bid for labor and compete with labor, for bidding for labor with the corporate sector. It's an easy argument to be made that that's what's happening right now. Things like student loan forbearance, um, UB, uh, you know, eviction moratoriums, child tax credit, extended unemployment benefits in many, many states. And I know some of those have uh, expired already, but it is, it, and talk about just uh, minimum wage raises too. So at the same time, they're trying to bring the wage portion of inflation of it too. And then you have everything. Then you have demand, the supply, the wage, and then you can get into that wage-driven inflation cycle that they seem to have wanted. And when I say they, I'm talking about the Federal Reserve for the last 10 years. And I just would say, be careful what you wish for, because it's, it's insanity to me to let that cat out of the bag when you have zero idea if you can control it or not. So do you think that the Fed does have the tools to rein this in? No. So then what do you do to position your portfolio accordingly? I have, for me, I have the whole dollar hedge section of my portfolio, which is uh, real estate, platinum, gold, silver, Bitcoin, Ethereum, um, there's other stuff too that I'm forgetting right now, but these are all to me, what if, what if, you know, what if things get, get start to get really bad? And I also, and then there's different levels. There's trading dollar weakness, and then there's the, you know, gather all your stuff, head for high ground, because it's really hit the fan sort of trade. And that involves something a lot more serious than just owning paper, gold, and silver. Um, I do know, I have friends, and you know, they used to be crazy preppers who had guns and gold and a house in the mountains. Again, I'm saying that, the chance of a cataclysmic currency event are low. I think very low. The dollar's global hegemony is currently not being challenged. So I want that completely out there. However, I think that it's changed greatly over the last couple of years, and, it, and the odds of it happening have gone up. Three okay. to five percent. Do you not think that the dollar status as a global reserve currency is in imminent danger. No, here's what I think. I think we're pointed <clears throat> directly with the policies that we have, we're pointed directly at a path that leads to a, a cataclysmic currency collapse, which is, I like that. I like how that sounds about it. Now, I'm also saying that that's years and years away and there's exits all along. And all it's going to take is one sensible adult in the room to take some of these exits. Now, the question is, do we have them? We, I thought Jay Powell was the guy. He seems reasonably, seems solid. But the fact that he continues to buy $40 billion a month of mortgage-backed bonds into a housing market that any logical person would tell you is on fire, to me, makes me question his competence. What are some of the exits along the way? Stop printing money. Okay. Stop keeping rates inorganically low. You can make an argument that rates have been kept inorganically low since the mid, mid to early 80s. So rates should be where borrower, where borrower meets lender. When the Fed gets involved in that, it does two things. It lowers rates and it increases malinvestment or walking out the risk curve, which people wouldn't have done. But it also affects just the messaging from certain rates, like the repo market. The Fed involved in the repo market and they want to have a standing repo facility. But financial uh, 
financial markets look to the repo market as an indication of the health and the uh, of certain borrowers and lenders within that structure. Now, if the Fed comes in and stands there and just they're the central clearinghouse of repo, and by the way, I don't think anyone has to understand what repo even is to understand what I'm saying here, is that the Fed is involved in this transaction now and no longer do we receive the messages from that from that rate. Does that make sense? Yes. Like what they've done in the, the, with the yield curve. Right. Like with the yield curve. It used to be when the yield curve flattened and inverted, we could believe that there was an imminent recession. It was an excellent predictor. Now, the Fed is actively, um, actively manipulating long-end rates. Well, that takes away some of the predictive power. So all of a sudden, you can think things are fine when they're not or think things are bad when they're not. So these are the exit strategies that the Fed can take Get along the, the way, way. Yeah. to prevent the cataclysmic currency collapse, I That's, believe you yeah, called it's it, good, the isn't triple it? It's C. fun, isn't yeah. it? <laughs> Maybe fun to say, say will not to be say, fun right. to live through. No, those are, when, when those things happen, those are the worst, worst kind of crises. You know what I mean? When, when you see that in Crocs, Venezuela, you know, the, the feral cat, and rat population went down because that's, I mean, that becomes a food yes. source when currencies yes. collapse. And again, I'm not saying that's going to happen. I'm saying we're being a little cavalier. Okay, but you do not believe that we're headed to the, towards that level of I crisis. We're pointed at it, but I don't believe we're going to get there. Okay, hopefully. But I'm going to be prepared a little bit. And that preparation entails what? Well, as we said, that the, my dollar portfolio, which is the gold, platinum, silver, okay. Uh, real estate, I think, you know, I can't stress that enough. Not just paper real estate, but actual real estate. What is your position on the equity market, given that we've established that we could be on the way to this doomsday scenario, though it'll take some time, and inflation is proving to be a lot stickier than anticipated? Okay, stocks don't mind inflation. Stocks don't like stagflation. Um, they don't mind some inflation. I actually am still somewhat bullish on the stock market. Everybody, we talked today here about um, potential bubbles. I think we're in a, a stage of bubble creation, but I think we're in an early stage. I think that everything that, you, that I look at is up 30%, up 40% since pre-pandemic levels. And I'm talking about lumber, cotton, natural gas. Why shouldn't the stocks be up too? They're just another thing that's denominated in dollars. The reality of it is, is just the dollars 25% lower than it was. So the, some of the stock market gain, and I know that, that that multiples are not very attractive, but multiples have stayed not very attractive for long periods of time. So I'm still okay with the stock market. Are there any particular sectors that you're particularly bullish on with I the am. stock market? I am, and it's the, the Russell 2000 is what I'm beginning to look at more now, and I'm planning some positioning once it, I like, as a technical trader, I see the Russell's been in a rel relatively tight range for about the last few months. As it starts to move higher, I plan on buying it. Now, the fundamental reason I'm going to say is that you know, the NASDAQ outperformed aggressively since the March 23rd of 2020 lows. Um, when we bounced off those lows, the NASDAQ had rates were going to zero or thereabouts. Tech stocks love that. Gro the growth portfolio loves loves low rates because they're valued by every Wall Street analyst on this uh, discounted cash flow model. So if rates start to go higher, which they could now, the NASDAQ could be hurt. Plus also they were the work from home stocks, the digital age, the information the out being in person, uh, and they benefited from that greatly. Um, now I think that's going to reverse. And I think, so the, the argument I make for Russell is less good than the argument I make against the NASDAQ. I'm not sure the technicals are saying that the Russell is, and perhaps the fundamental story is that's going to be more of a domestic story, domestic growth story. Why would the Russell, which is predominantly made of smaller cap stocks, perform well when we could be in a stagflationary environment, when the IMF, for example, cutting the U.S. growth forecast by one full percent, and inflation is proving to be sticky while growth forecasts are not as robust. Why would that support your case that uh, the Russell 2000 could be poised it to benefit? It certainly doesn't, the way you put it, by the way. <laughs> but what does support the case is that the government still continues its spending, still continues injecting money into the system. The Fed perhaps begins to get out of the way, although I don't believe that the Fed will get out of the way as quickly as some people think. And I think the Fed will keep rates low. So any argument you can give that's negative for stocks in general, his, for the last, uh, not even just the last two years, perhaps the last five, six, seven years, you can make the counter argument that anything bad is coupled with more excess spending, more uh, lower rates, dovish Fed, that counterbalances the negative. So I think that- So you don't see the Fed tapering? <laughs> no, I mean, the Atlanta, uh, Atlanta Fed just lowered their GDP estimates from 6% 
to 0.5%. I don't know exactly which quarter they're talking about. Again, but I don't care. The point is, is that things are changing quickly, as you said. So the Fed tapering in that kind of environment seems kind of silly to me. Um, should they? I, I mean, they absolutely should taper. I said before they should get out of the way. I, get, I guess the odds of the Fed tapering is what I'm going to say. I have lessened. All right, let's circle back to silver, because as you said, that is sort of your prime pick at the moment. At the moment. And you said that some of the interest in silver has been taken away, and in gold has been taken away by Bitcoin, which has now reached an all-time high. Mm -hmm. Does that trend continue then? That part I don't know. Um, I think so. I think that that what's really interesting to the me- The trend that is of, of Bitcoin taking away interest yes. from, from silver, just to yes. clarify. I, I, okay, so I'm gonna say that's a yes. You know, we're in, this week we're in is the week of a launch of a Bitcoin ETF. Um, all along the way, every different level of institutional adoption validates cryptocurrencies. Um, El Salvador, not an economically significant country, but a real live country, adopting that as a currency. It's an amazing thing. I thought the biggest the biggest instance is when the CME launched their Bitcoin futures in 2017, kind of legitimized Bitcoin. I don't know if they intended to do that. Actually, I, I did meet with the FT, F, uh, Future Trade Commission on that too. And they're like, no, just people want to trade Bitcoin and you know, we don't want to stop them. So they didn't really have an opinion on it. But I think in the, uh, the, allowing that contract to happen has given some legitimacy to crypto. Again, I'm in crypto. I don't try to trade it and time it. I'm keeping it as a dollar hedge in case of the cataclysmic event we're talking about, and I don't want to be without proper dollar hedges. I'm not sure that's the right one, but it belongs in the portfolio, I think. Okay, so 12-month outlook for silver, you said $35. Sure. What's your five and 10-year outlook for silver? I'm, I'm a trader. I don't even necessarily do five and 10 year. Um, so I'm not gonna, I'm gonna say no to that, is that okay? I like my different portfolios that I trade are you know two week, three month, six month a year. I will give it. I, I do think once this ball starts rolling, it could roll for a long time. So I, I think it was B of A that came out with a piece saying $50 silver. Uh, they came out with a couple of months ago talking about the Green New Deal commodities. Uh, sure, let's go with that. But again, I will, I will couch that with saying that five years out is not really my thing. Okay, but a year out is your thing. Sure. And you've got $35 silver a year out. Can't talk about Silva without quickly touching on this notion of Silva price manipulation, that there are so many people that have a vested interest in suppressing the price of Silva because of its use in a range of in industrial sectors, and that there is more paper Silva out there than there is physical Silva to cover it. Let's quickly get your thoughts on that. Well, that's one of the reasons you use technical analysis to get entry points, because that fundamental story of push-pull is fascinating. It's compelling. It's it's valid. So you as a trader, and even like a, if you call a year out investing, have to pick a time where you think the wave is tipping, cresting, whatever that metaphor is. And that's what I believe is happening now. I believe that fight to keep it lower is beginning to be lost okay. and that the market then will override it. All right, so the fight to suppress silver is being lost and silver is poised Did I say for that? its time Sounds to shine. Sounds good, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's time to shine. You had to use that one more time, right? I had to use it again. All right, well, thank you we so much. We didn't say gold has lost its luster in this whole interview, by well, the way, too. And I'm just glad, oh, shoot. <laughs> <laughs> but we've, you've said a lot of very interesting things, so thank you so much. Thank we you. appreciate your insights. Jim Urio, thank you so much for joining My us pleasure. from Kitco. Thank you. Kitco News special coverage of the New Orleans Investment Conference is brought to you by Uranium Energy Corp., Uranium Royalty, Gold Mining and Gold Royalty Corp.